Good evening once again, gentlemen. It's good to see you all settle down with your port and cigars. The um, evening, this evening's talk, as uh, Mr. Mulhern mentioned to you, is the dawn of history. You may recall that last time we got right up to the point of the fall of man. Adam and Eve in the garden. And this is an important thing to meditate on, not simply because original sin made us what we are, <laughs> such as we are, uh, but also because, in a very real sense, history begins with the fall. Before the fall, mankind, in its two living representatives, lived like God, in a sense, outside of history, outside of our history. Because what history is basically is the working out of God's will in fallen nature. That is what history is. It's like a current, God's will. You can swim against it or you can swim with it. If you swim with it, you may or may not drown. But even if you do drown in this world, you'll live forever in the next. If you swim against it, you'll be dashed to pieces on the rocks. But whatever you decide to do, the current goes on. And this is ultra, ultra, ultra important to get down in our minds. We do not live for ourselves. We do not live outside of time. We are, all of us, on a, gra on a grand and vast journey, which has its end in heaven or in hell. But whichever place we go, we won't go alone. Either singing with us or shrieking at us will people we have helped to get wherever we end up. And, of course, the greater individuals we are, the more effect that we have on the people around us, the more they'll be in that happy chorus. So, having said all of that, let's review just a little bit what the effects of the fall on human nature were. Well, for starters, death. We die. We get sick. We get old. It's very unpleasant. That comes to us in the fall. More importantly, our will was weakened. It is much easier for us to do wrong than to do right. It is easier for us to give in to sin than to refuse it. It's much, much easier. And most important of all, we were cut off from heaven forever. As a result of the fall, no man could enjoy the face of the Father. Now, in philosophical terms, what one must say is that our parents left one universal, unfallen man, and entered another, fallen man. We became a new creature, even as we say in baptism. A new creature. We were not what God had intended for us to be. We were what we wanted to be. And much good did it bring us. Well, that being the case, also bear in mind that none of the just of the Old Testament, none of the good guys, before the coming of Christ, went to heaven. Nobody, not know how, not no way. Human beings in those days went to one of several places. They could go to hell, properly so called, to burn forever and be punished and get what they deserved. They could go to purgatory, assuming that their sins were so great that they needed that, that sort of purgation until after the coming of our Lord, and yet they would go to heaven one day. They could, if they were just, those who would die today, go to heaven. They could go to the limbo of the fathers, which was like hell in that they're cut off from God, but wasn't like hell in that they weren't punished. They uh, had the utmost of natural happiness. Or, if you died before the age of reason, you could, then as now, get to go to the limbo of the infants. And that was very much like the limbo of the fathers with this one little difference. You can't get out. A note on limbo might be useful here as far as the limbo of the infants go. Uh, remember that while on the one hand, the, those who went to limbo, either limbo of the fathers, limbo of the infants, didn't enjoy the beatific vision. 
and did not enjoy the joys of heaven, on the one hand. On the other hand, neither did they endure the natural pains of life, which we go through. To put it another way, when you're speaking to a woman who has lost her unbaptized infant, while on the one hand, you can't tell her that her child is with God, on the other hand, what you can say is that the kid is much, has it much better off than she ever has had up to now. So, bear that in mind if you ever have to comfort a grieving mother. It's, uh, sometimes makes the loss a bit better. Now, another name for the limbo of the fathers that you'll see in the Old Testament is, in the New Testament, is the bosom of Abraham. So when you see that phrase, that's what it's referring to, the limbo of the fathers. Okay. Now, thrust out of the garden, uh, Adam and Eve went to work making kids. And we all know that they made two of them to begin with. Two males are mentioned first. Cain and Abel. And we all know how Cain slew his brother. Just on the lighter side, you know that the Mormons teach that the Negroes, the blacks, are descended from Cain. And in the Book of Mormon, it says that to punish um, Cain's offspring, he did cause to be put upon them a skin of blackness, in that delicate phrase. So, there are no black people around today. There are no blacks. I know you think there are, but there can't really be, because since none of Cain's descendants made it on the ark, if the Mormons are right, the blacks were all wiped out in the flood. So, it's amazing that never seems to have occurred to them, but never mind. Anyway, moving right along. You will recall that Cain was driven out and went to dwell to the east of Eden in the land of Nod. Lovely phrase, that, and one which gave John Steinbeck the title of a book, which later became a movie with James Dean, East of Eden. And it's interesting, I, I should tell you at this point, how much the Bible has entered in to our language. Not just English, of course, but all the other Christian languages. But think of the phrases, East of Eden, the Mark of Cain, all these things that people use in everyday speech. And we rarely stop to think where they came from. But anyway, that's all by the by. So, then was produced Seth. And from Seth do we all descend in the male line. Now, you're probably wondering, I always did when I was a kid, who did Cain and Seth marry? They married their sisters. Isn't that incest, I can hear someone saying? Well, no, it isn't, because at that time, they were the entirety of the human race. Incest only became a problem when, if you'll pardon the expression, the gene pools started to become isolated. And in later days, when you would marry your sister, and this was done for a long period of time, you would produce strange and deformed children. It's interesting, though, that that memory of our first parents survived into the ancient world because in many ancient empires including Egypt it was the custom for the kings to marry their sisters a vague memory of what had been before however this being more recent and not the early days before the uh, flood I can assure you it didn't really have a very good effect on them and after after several generations of this each of the Egyptian dynasties for instance would tend to get a little bit feeble-minded. Anyway, moving right along. You have heard that the um, patriarchs of the Old Testament lasted rather a long time, a longer time than we're used to. Methuselah lived 900 years, but oh my, as uh, is said in Porgy and Bess by the dear departed uh, George Gershwin. Actually, it was longer than 900 years, but still. We look at that today and we say, how could this have been? How could this have been? Well, I've heard a number of ingenious explanations for it, none of which come to my mind just at the moment. But I will tell you this much. When I was a little boy and I was in school, they told us about Cro-Magnon Man. Remember Cro-Magnon Man when they showed you the evolutionary chart? You know, we started out as little gibbony looking things and then we turned into Lucy and then we turned into uh, Australopithecus and then we became Neanderthals, uh, those on the football team stayed that way, I guess. 
And then we had Cro-Magnon Man. And I remember the Dear Nun, to, who was just before us, you see, on the evolutionary scale. And I remember the, the Dear Nun saying, well, Cro-Magnon Man was stronger and more robust than modern man. And Cro-Magnon Man had a bigger brain case, a bigger brain and more wrinkles in it. So he was probably smarter than modern man. <laughs> and Cro-Magnon Man probably had fewer diseases than we did until the invention of inoculation, judging by the archaeological record. And she'd go on and on and on and on. And finally, at the end of it, I said, pardon me, sister, but that doesn't sound like evolution. <laughs> I don't think we evolved from that. It sounds like we degenerated. And in point of fact... That always seemed to me, from that day onward, to be a bit of an explanation as to how those patriarchs could have lasted so long. Because what you see from the first fossils that they are willing to actually say were Homo sapiens, from that time there has been something of a degeneration. Not an evolution. Something to think about. If you're very interested in all this kind of thing, I could do no better than to recommend to you Mr. Jerry Keene's book, Creation Rediscovered, in which it goes into all this stuff in great detail, more than I'm prepared to do so. But uh, nevertheless, that those are the patriarchs. Now, we then read in the Bible that they got really corrupt, the people of that time. Awfully corrupt. And this brings us to another interesting question. You know, the field of archaeology has established for itself a very definite timeline. And when new discoveries are made, they try to fit them into the timeline, no matter what. If something doesn't fit into that timeline, then they ignore it. I am reminded of the discovery some years ago of an aluminum belt uh, around a, uh, a skeleton in an ancient tomb in China. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that until the last century, nobody ever knew about aluminum because without certain techniques, which are not, just didn't exist prior to the last century, it's impossible to pull aluminum out of bauxite, which is what aluminum comes from. So, how did an ancient Chinese skeleton get an aluminum belt? I do not know, but I do know that aluminum has a very hard time breaking down. And so it could be that that aluminum belt is rather older than the Chinaman around whom it was found. The fact of the matter is, in any case, abduction, that's it, it is a UFO abduction. Well, no. But the point, the point that needs to be made, though, is that our, uh, our notions of archaeological time, of archaeological progression, may be very much at variance from the truth. You have brought up a good, a good piece with... Um, abduction. Twenty years ago, when I was a young lad, there was a chap running around, uh, running around called Eric von Däniken, who started a whole genre of pulp literature. Tons and tons and tons and tons of little paperback books, all of them with sort of double bold typefaced titles came out. His first one that started the craze going was Chariots of the Gods. And um, I myself wrote a very small satire of this when I was in junior high, and I called it Hot Rods of the Gods. But that's neither here nor there. Another story. Uh, what is important, however, is that this whole genre of stuff basically wanted to prove that life on Earth was either brought from another planet or aliens from outer space did this or that with this or whatever. But whatever the case, they were responsible for all the archaeological anomalies which exist. And there are a lot of them. There's no denying it. There are a lot of archaeological anomalies, things that do not fit the timeline. But, you know, what if they didn't come from outer space? This is a big what if, sheer speculation on my part, but it's something that's always fascinated me, so I throw it up to you for what it's worth. Given the evidences of extremely ancient civilization on this earth, Given, well, even the cave paintings, you know, uh, which are actually rather, in terms of technique and all that, rather sophisticated, and which were done in places which uh, required light, and which, had they used torches, would have steadily and quickly suffocated them. I, even today, I don't think anyone would want to suffer for their art quite that much. How did they light the bloody things? 
how did they do those cave paintings? This is a small thing. Never been able to find an answer to it. I throw this out as a suggestion, coupled with the biblical notion that mankind became corrupt. How could mankind become all that corrupt in a primitive setting? As you know, there are many vices available to us that were not available to our grandparents, and many more coming. And by vices, I don't just mean, you know, strange and bizarre sexual practices. No, no, no. I mean fiddling with genes. I mean doing strange and peculiar things to infants. All kinds of things that mark us apart from any generation we know, historically, as really, really horrid. Uh, I remember the uh, Roman poet Horace's wonderful little uh, piece, Injurious time, what age escapes thy curse? Evil our grandsires were, our fathers worse. And we, till now unmatched in ill, must leave successors more corrupted still. Well, given that little law of human history, just how corrupt could the people before the flood have been if they were nothing but a bunch of shepherds? I hazard this guess, that along with the original revelation that God gave to Adam, the original, the first unveiling of true religion, he gave him a lot of other information as well. His long-lived descendants, I hazard this guess, were possibly much more civilized than we ever gave them credit for. And they became corrupt only in the way that highly civilized people are able to become. That's my personal guess. It would also, I have to say, account for a lot of legends in the world. You know, all the stories of Atlantis and Mu. Anybody hear about Mu? Ever heard that? Yes, well, you would. You were around in the 60s. You would know. Well, way back in the 1930s, an enterprising British colonel called Colonel James Churchward wrote a series of books about the supposed Pacific continent called Mu. M-U. Mu. Oh. The cow continent. No, he didn't say that. But one of the, he had a lot of interesting stuff, interesting real archaeology mixed up with all sorts of strange ideas and theosophy and whatnot. But the gist of it was, is that on many of these little tiny Pacific islands, there are vast ruins, much too large to have been built by any of the populations that have lived there or that those islands could support. And Churchward's notion was that these were all remnants of a past civilization encompassing the Pacific. And he called it Mu. You've heard of Atlantis. Well, that was sort of the same thing, supposedly, in the Atlantic. All right, keep those ideas in mind. We'll come back to them. Both places supposedly vanished by sinking into the sea. And that whole motif of sinking brings us to Noah and his ark. Well, we are told that a vast flood encompassed the whole world and wiped out everybody but Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives, and two of every kind of creature that he could get on the ark. Well, I remember when I was in high school, Dominican high school, uh, Daniel Murphy down in L.A., Father Riley, who taught the Bible as Literature course to us freshmen, we called it Why Genesis Ain't So, that was our jovial nickname for the class, he mentioned that every culture has a flood story, without exception. They have yet to find a primitive culture, or for that matter an advanced one, a, a mythology that doesn't have a story of a universal flood. And it's always pretty much the same. The people who lived before the flood were wicked, so they got wiped out, except for a couple of survivors who either went on a boat or they hid on a mountain. Those are the two ways of escaping it. And from the few people that survived, everyone else descends. And so he said, this shows that the flood story is nothing but one expression of this universal folklore motif, so it doesn't really mean much of anything anyway. And this sort of struck me back. Maybe I'm backwards, I don't know, but I never quite catch these things in the same spirit in which they're offered. I said, well, wait a minute, Father, wait a minute. The story is that everybody's wiped out with the flood, except for a few survivors, right? He says, yes. 
Well, now, if that were actually literally true, wouldn't all the descendants of those survivors have different flood stories, more or less corresponding, more or less, to what really happened? And if that flood were truly universal, wouldn't you expect every culture to have a story of the flood? Really, Father, if the only account we had of a universal flood was in the Bible, I might begin to doubt it. But if every culture has a story of it, as you're saying, that to me should be proof of it. He told me I didn't understand and that where did I get my degree in biblical studies anyway. But nevertheless, I stand by the question that I asked then. If we are indeed all descended from survivors of the flood, then one would expect that every culture upon earth would have a story of the flood. And you know what? Every culture on earth does. So, that being the case, looking back to our little little notion of perhaps of an antediluvian civilization, you might say, well, why, if they were so civilized before the flood, why didn't they just pick up where they left off after they were flooded out? Well, what if you or I, with all of our computers and electric lights and all that, would cast a drift on a desert island? We wouldn't, all of our experience of technology wouldn't help us at all. We'd be lucky just to have skills to keep us alive, let alone anything else. So, uh, imagine, if you will, a small group of survivors on an empty and barren world. That is what our first post-Diluvian ancestors had to go through. Notice also that our multiple great-grandfather Noah gave us an important gift. Booze. Indeed, indeed. And reading that, I always thought to myself, wouldn't he have needed it? All of his friends and further relations under thousands of feet of mud. It must have been just incredible. You wonder how they survived it psychologically. They talk about a great settling of the frontiers, you know, in uh, North America and in the Pampa and South America and Australia and all that. Settlers going out into vast, vast, vast regions that were empty. Well, this was much worse. They at least had a home they could be vaguely connected to. These people didn't. They had to start over entirely new. Uh, backtracking for a bit, just because the booze made me think of it. We have an old French-Canadian legend about the fall of man and about the flight from Eden. When Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, so the story goes, the angel said they could pick two plants to take with them as keepsakes. So Adam chose the onion and the garlic. And then, when the dog saw that his master was being thrown out of Eden, he said, well, I'm going with him. He won't go out by himself. The cat, meanwhile, looked around and saw all these huge and fearsome beasts and figured, well, if I'm left with them, I won't be anything special. So the cat jumped on the dog's back, and they followed Adam and Eve out of the garden. So that, they say, is why it is that the cat and the dog are as they are. The dog left with us out of loyalty and the cat to see what she could get. So I offer that as a little bit of legend for you. Anyway. Going back to the flood. So there they are, the survivors. From those three sons of Noah are descended the three races of mankind. From Ham came the blacks. From Shem came the Middle Easterners and the uh, Asians and people of that sort. And from Japheth came the Europeans. That's us, more or less. Now, as we see from the Bible, their descendants, their immediate descendants, spoke one language, had one, one uh, uh, one language, one way of um, uh, communicating, one culture, and left to themselves in this this desolate planet they lived on, they would have just huddled together until kingdom came. But that was not God's will. It was God's will that the whole globe be populated. So, he selected a time when Noah's great-grandson, Nimrod, a hunter mighty in the sight of the Lord, decided to build a tower to heaven, the Tower of Babel. 
He decided at that point to break up the languages and send them scurrying off in varying directions. Now, here you see, in this story of the Tower of Babel, the beginnings of two cross currents in human history. Mankind has at once a desire to be one and a desire to break off into his own little community. And we all of us feel the same thing every day as individuals. It's true. Take just your own family. On the one hand, as you're growing up, you want to be your own man. But on the other hand, if you have to be alone at Christmas, you feel horrible. So which is it? Which is it going to be? Well, that's part of the dilemma of being a human being. It's both at once. Uh, throughout history, on the one hand, peoples have wanted to gather together in ever bigger empires. On the other hand, they wanted their little village to be totally independent and not, not given over to anybody's rule. And this continual jockeying between these two impulses is current in the individual and in the larger entity, in the microcosm, the macrocosm. Now, the world that our ancestors set out on was a very strange place, even after all the plants started growing again and everything else. It was chaotic. Remember last time I spoke of demons. I spoke of, well, whatever they are. Elves, fairies, name them. They and strange and peculiar and bizarre creatures of all sorts lurked throughout this planet. Chaos reigned supreme. And on man fell the sacred duty of establishing order. Order out of chaos. Of building fences, of tacking down land. Of building against the forces of chaos, which always seemed ready to overwhelm him. And remember that for most of our, our history, there haven't been that many people on the planet. They really haven't. So you'd have a small group. They'd follow a river or a, a valley away from wherever they'd been born into the depths of the wilderness, which were very, very frightening. They'd be dying of disease. They didn't have enough to eat. Maybe they'd die of famine. Crops had failed, whatever. Wild animals would carry them off. It wasn't very pleasant. And remember also, they didn't have electric lights. The night was supreme. It was a world lit only by fire, to use a title of a book that's been out recently, but a wonderful phrase. If you had hovered over the continent at any time prior to the year 1870, you would have seen, well, well make it easy on myself, 1800. And you would hovered over Europe, or Asia, or America at night. The only lights you would have seen would have been torchlight processions and a few boys out at sea. That's all. When you stepped out of your house at night, you were in another world. And even inside, only so far as the firelight lit could you consider yourself somewhat safe. And the people who lived for all those millennia under those circumstances were very much aware of their dependence upon God. Because... If the rains didn't come, the crops failed and they starved. Huddled in their houses around the fire, or their caves or whatever they were living in, around the fire, they knew that both natural and supernatural forces of evil were outside and waiting for them. The irony is that none of this has changed, really. We think it has, because we use electricity. And because we've been able to do farming on a large scale, and so we've ameliorated at least in the Western world, a lot of these problems. But you know, a few, few good drought years, a few good earthquakes in the right place, a few volcanoes spewing out, guess what? It'd be all she wrote. And as far as supernatural evil goes, well, possessions and hauntings and God knows what continue on today. In with and under our electric light. So, we're really not all that different in that different a position from our ancestors. It's just that we don't notice. Kind of like the ostrich with his head in the sand. Anyway, there were three 
count them three roles which early emerged in the human community. And these roles vaguely reflected God himself. The first role which first Adam and then Noah occupied was that of father. Fatherhood is a very important thing. We don't think about it, especially today, but we really should. A father is, in his way, an imitator of God the Father. He's a creator, master of his house, order of all things, if you will, the representative of order within the chaos of the home. That's the role of the father, really. From him comes the law in the home. From him comes the tone. If it doesn't, and of course today it rarely does in our society, then you've got a society that's got a lot of problems and will turn out tons of neurotics, just like ours. Funny how that works. Well, after a while, there were enough people around that I, I should say also that in ancient times, the fathers performed uh, the sacrifices. I, I haven't touched on sacrifice, have I? But I really should. All through the ancient world, until the coming of Christ, as the revelation first given to our first parents became more and more uh, distorted, what did survive, uh, amongst other things, was the notion that all was not right between God and man. No matter how left out, no matter how ignorant, no matter how whatever a grieven group of people were, they were smart enough to know that something really wasn't right. <laughs> the legend of the fall is as ubiquitous as the legend of the flood. They knew something was really wrong. And so the notion of sacrifice arose, of giving up something you really valued, to try and redress whatever had gone wrong between God and man. And they sacrificed everything you could think of, from flowers to maidens, whatever would do the trick. As mankind spread out, as the memory of the original revelation became further distorted, uh, a number of the other notions uh, began to get obscured. For instance, it's amazing in how many of the world's religions, the further back you get, the more like ancient Judaism they become. Hinduism, for instance, even today to, a, some, to something of a degree, but much more so in its earliest records, was Trinitarian. One God with three persons, who in the course of time became three separate gods, and in turn were seen to have all sorts of facets which became separate gods, and on and on and on. Until in modern Hinduism, you have tons and tons and tons of different gods. Something similar occurred with Japanese Shinto, uh, the layout of whose temples is very reminiscent of the notion of, of the plan of the temple given to David in Jerusalem. There are all these sorts of similes. That's why I've always found uh, uh, comparative religions so fascinating, because you see these parallels everywhere if you look hard enough. Anyway, so that notion of sacrifice was there at the very beginning, as Cain and Abel did. It was the father who practiced the sacrifice. And even today, in Catholic countries, the fathers bless their children, often once a year on New Year's. They're the ones to lead any family prayers. These are all just slight reminders of the original priestly role of the father. But when they got to be lots of families, obviously they couldn't all be independent because nothing would work. You had to have them cooperate. So another institution arose. There would be a single father for the whole country. The king. And the king had a sacred role as the father did. Like the father, his authority came from God. He was, like the father in the home, God's viceroy in the state. And he too performed the sacrifices in the beginning the great sacrifices. Up until, uh, to this day in Japan, and up until the deposition of the last emperor of China in 1912, both emperors were considered the chief priests of the national cult. And they and they alone offered the highest sacrifices to the single god at the head of each country's pantheon of gods. Uh, this was true also in, um, in uh, ancient America, amongst the Inca where the son of the son, as he was called, 
the Inca was said to be the son of the sun god, he carried out the major sacrifices. You see, the notion that kings were somehow descended from the gods was a reflection of this divine origin of their, of their role. However, as time went on, there were more people, these little kingdoms become ever more complex, a third role emerges, the priesthood. Now, the priesthood retained in every society a certain amount of legal authority. Uh, we remember in the Bible, Melchizedek, the priest king of Salem. Here you've got a fellow sort of fa frozen framed at the point where kingship and priesthood were beginning to diverge. He was both at once, the priest king of Salem. Uh, and it's, it's interesting that Christ is always spoken of in the New Testament in connection with Melchizedek, who likewise presented bread and wine. One thing it's important to remember about history is that like everything else, it reflects back on itself. Everything prefigures something else. Everything is the fulfillment of something else. It's truly a never-ending story. Anyway, all of that having happened, the priesthood emerged in every society, and there again, there were certain things common to every priesthood. They were the ones in charge of the sacrifices and the temples. They could only come from certain families, or they could only marry certain people, or they couldn't marry at all, or they could only eat certain foods, or they couldn't do certain things, or they had to do certain things. Uh, if you look for broad patterns like this, the commonalities come out. I mean, you come into the whole question of the natural law at this point, of the law that's engraved on every man's heart. Well, man, unless he's corrupted, knows certain things. Part of it, perhaps consciously, as a result of that first revelation, but part of it simply because it's engraved in him. The soul is naturally Christian, as Tertullian put it. So, man always knows, as I've said, that something is wrong with him. He knows that. And he constantly looks, consciously or otherwise, for some way to address that balance. Man has a certain basic sexual morality. It's true that in some societies, uh, you could have two or three or four wives, or two or three or four husbands. But with the exception of very, very small and isolated elements, little tribes here and there, no major culture says you could have anybody you want any time you want. That is a commonality. There are others. Um, parents should take care of their children. They probably shouldn't eat them. And when these things are violated, although the civilization in question may not notice anything's wrong, you better believe their neighbors will. For instance, this is getting way ahead of ourselves, but you may remember the Carthaginians who sent Hannibal against Rome. Why was it that the Carthaginians inspired such hatred and loathing, not just in the Romans, but in all the peoples around them? Was it because they had five legs? No. Was it because they weren't highly educated and sophisticated? No. Were they cannibals? No. Nothing like that. Just one little thing. It was their custom amongst their wealthier classes to sacrifice their infants to the gods for money, for material gain. And you know, although they traded with them, all their neighbors thought the Carthaginians were just incredibly perverse people. For that one little thing. Now, mind you, we are not talking about societies that had what we would consider highly developed sense of morals. The Greeks, you know, by our standards, they were a very immoral people. Uh, ditto the Romans. But perverse as they could be in their own way, they all thought the Carthaginians were horrible. So unnatural is it to slaughter one's own children. Imagine a society built upon the notion that to slaughter one's children for the sake of economic gain is a positive good. We'd have to say that was a pretty perverse society if we were ancient Romans. Luckily, we're modern Americans, so it's a constitutional right, and we have nothing to worry about. But think about that. Fortunate are we not 
that our ancestors are not here to talk to us. Anyway, now, I spoke earlier of Atlantis and Mu. If these places exist, what characterize them in the legends that have come down to us? They started out pretty deep, and they got corrupt. And God of the gods punished them by sinking them deep. That's what happened to them. Well, this is a recurring motif in our history. The price of success is often corruption. And the price of corruption is decline and ruin. It's true, as so many other things are in national life. It's true in individual life. So, now, eventually, we're not quite sure how, certain groups of humans gathered in certain places and began what we would call today civilization. Do we have a globe? Not Mars, Earth, yes. While the globe is being obtained, these centers of civilization uh, had several things in common. They were centered around rivers. That's very important. It's important because on the one hand, the rivers ensured, generally speaking, there would be enough water and enough fertile land to raise a lot of crops. And one thing about uh, complex, organized living, it takes a lot of food. It takes a lot of food that you can rely on. And without it, forget it. Also, the river is allowed for trade, and that's something else civilization requires. You've got to be able to trade. Because you produce something, I produce something different. Uh, I want what you have, you have what I want. And if we don't kill each other, the result is trade. Both of our lives are improved. We have to work less hard for a living. We could begin to think about things other than keeping our gullets full and propitiating the gods. Uh, if you will direct your attention to the beach ball globe that my, uh, my associate here is going to hold for you. Uh, everyone get oriented. You see this is the ancient world. There's Africa, Europe, Asia. Can we see that at all? Or is it too dim? All right. Well, the first of our centers of civilization that we'll look at was Sumeria, which arose in the area called the Fertile Crescent, which is now Iraq. We did our best to bomb it recently. Uh, they say that it was somewhere around there that the Garden of Eden was. So perhaps it isn't all that surprising that that should be the first area we could think of where they had civilized living. And what did you have? You had little city-states emerge, like Sumer, uh, Ur of the Chaldees, remember that from the Bible? And at first, each of these had their little kings, and in this case, the king of Sumer conquered all the other ones and put together the first organized state, Sumeria. Then, the next point of time was in the, the valley of the Nile, the upper reaches of the Nile, lower reaches of the Nile, I should say, in Egypt. You remember that from all the mummy movies. Now, the third place we don't know nearly so well. It developed in the uh, Indus Valley region of India and Pakistan. Then, there was in the Yellow River, in the Far East, China. The Chinese civilization is remarkable because it's the only one of all the ancient civilizations which has lasted more or less without a real break to our own day. And lastly, Greece. Greece. And Greece, that's enough of the globe, thanks. Greece is the most important for our purposes. Why? Because it was in Greece that our concepts of philosophy 
and law and individual freedom, really all the non-strictly religious aspects of our civilization developed. We are all of us the heirs of the Greeks. And when the Greeks first appear in our history, they appear as little tribal king kingdoms run by sort of heroic Viking-like characters, the Mycenaeans. And the Mycenaeans um, were sort of fascinating because they, it was the stories about them which gave us our first well-known great piece of literature, pieces I should say, literature, the Iliad and the Odyssey. They come from the Mycenaean days. And they record the fight of a bunch of these little Mycenaean kinglets with a big city called Troy. And Troy and the Trojan War are very, very important to know about. Why? Again, it's because the whole Trojan War illustrates an important aspect of archaeology that we forget at our peril. For centuries, everybody thought the Trojan War was a myth. Never happened. No such place as Troy. For 400 years after the Greek poet Homer composed the Odyssey and the Iliad, they were oral. They weren't written down. And incidentally, Homer, our first great writer, also illustrates what writers have had to put up with ever since. In the old rhyme, they say, Four cities claim the poet dead, through which the living poet begged his bread. Which means to say that after he died, four different cities claimed he'd been born there, and while he was alive, he was lucky to get a handout when he was in any of them. This has always been the fate of the writer, and may, may we all continue to enjoy it till doomsday. Anyway, what happened, though, was that way back in the 19th century, there was an amateur literature and archaeologist called Heinrich Schliemann who really, really liked the Iliad and the Odyssey, and he was so impressed by them that he resolved to find Troy. Bear in mind, after Homer's composition, for four centuries, the Iliad and the Odyssey were not written down. They were recited. They were remembered. They were not written down. But using the additions he had, written down no sooner than 400 years after the event, Heinrich Schliemann found the city of Troy using the directions in the stories. That should tell you that oral traditions are much more reliable than we tend to give them credit for. They're not perfect, not by a long shot. And they often need archaeology and this kind of thing to help flesh them out, help correct a few things. But they often tell us things we wouldn't figure out any other way. And what's interesting also, it tells you something about human nature. In localities where great historical things have happened, people will remember little things that never make it into the history books. Like, they may not remember who won a certain battle that was fought in the neighborhood 700 years ago. But for some reason, folk memory will remember that the losing general wore red. That they'll remember. Nothing else, but they'll remember that. It tells you something about uh, mankind, I guess. If you think about it, our own memories tend to work the same way. We often forget important things and remember trivia. I, um, as an illustration of this that I got to enjoy myself, I was in Lancashire in England in November in a little town uh, near Preston. And back in, under the, uh, in the days of, I think, Elizabeth, there was a Catholic martyr, a priest, called St. Edmund Arrowsmith, who was operating in that, in that neighborhood. And he said his last mass in a house there. And then the priest catchers found him, and he rode to escape them across a the field, and they caught up with him. And uh, then he was eventually taken to court and uh, martyred. And his hand is still preserved, not too far from there. Well, I was in the house where he said his last mass. And the fellow who owns the house is a native of the place. The attic where he said his last mass is still kept as a chapel. But it was very, very interesting sitting there with this old man because he told me about the events of that night as though it had happened last week. And the people in that district don't call him St. Edmund Arrowsmith. They call him Father Arrowsmith. And he said, and you know he was betrayed, I can't do the accent very well, but he said he was betrayed by a, a member of a family, I don't like to tell you who they are, we still have some of them in the parish, 
but him it was who was betrayed him. And they chased him over the field that night. And if the horse hadn't have dropped a shoe and stumbled, he'd have made his way, he'd have made his escape. But and he went on and on and on. And as he did it, as I say, it felt like it was two weeks ago. But it wasn't. It was four hundred years before. And the man could recite the story the way he'd had it from his father and him from his, as though it had happened to him. And it's something we've lost in our society. This folk memory. And of course, it's lost there too. Because all the young people in that district go away to college and then they go to London and that's gone. It's dead. So I felt very, very fortunate to have been able to sit in on something like that. Anyway, moving right along. The Trojan War uh, was also very interesting because according to legend, three, count them, three peoples claim to owe their origin to refugee Trojans. And these people are the Romans, who claim that the king of Troy's son, that was King Priam, one Aeneas, fled after many adventures with a detour in Carthage, fled to Rome. And so they consider that the founder of the Latin people around the city of Rome was not the founder of the city, but of that people that eventually founded it, uh, was a Trojan. Similarly, the Celts of Britain believed that Brutus, another Trojan prince, was their founder. And lastly, the Franks, a German tribe, all claimed that, they, that their first ancestor, I think Francus was his name, was also a Trojan refugee. Here you have the three perhaps most influential people in European history, all claiming Trojan descent. And this brings us to another interesting thing. That is that although the Trojans lost, they were held up to be the good guys, the brave guys, the folks who fought overwhelming odds and for 10 years withstood a siege. And this brings us to something which in Greek history has always been very admirable and because it was admirable to them it is admirable to us. To this day, the notion of a small band holding out against Uncountable odds is a motif that continues to have its power to over us to this day. I mean, think of Custer with a little bighorn. Do you really think that we would think twice about Custer if he'd been wiped, if there'd been so few of his men, and if they'd been wiped out by uh, a smaller army as has happened before? No, we would think he was just an incompetent. But the notion of this small, gallant band around General Custer, even though he wasn't a very good man. <laughs> And even though being in that position was the height of stupidity, and if he'd, if he'd followed the most basic strategy he learned in school, it would never have happened. Nevertheless, you say the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Custer's last stand, and it brings up all sorts of wonderful emotions in you. Thermopylae, which I'll mention a little bit. Uh, these few Greeks standing at the pass of Thermopylae, holding off the entire might of the Persian army. The Battle of Bunker Hill, same thing. The rebels entrenched in the hill and wave after wave of British troops coming up until finally at last they overwhelm them. Beaugest, little bunch of French out in the desert uh, holding off hordes of Tuaregs. On and on and on and on and on and on. That pattern was established in the Western mind by Troy. And it's interesting also that of those people they call the nine immortals, as I were, not the nine immortals, but the nine worthies, who were held up to the chivalry of Europe as the great examples whom knights should follow. The first of them was Hector, Prince of Troy, son of King Priam, who was killed by Achilles. So, remember the Trojan War, if you remember anything else. Its effects reverberate down to the present. And here, too, we have a lot of sayings. Achilles heel. Remember that? What that came from was that they say that the infant Achilles was held by his mother, dipped into a stream that rendered um, invulnerability to whoever was dipped in it. Well, she held the little infant by his heel and dipped him in. She should have held him down a little bit further because, of course, in the uh, story of the Iliad, Achilles gets killed because someone knows about the heel and gets him there. Uh... 
Similarly, you know the saying, the Trojan horse. And you remember, remember that that was how they broke the siege of Troy. They built this huge wooden horse, which they filled with Greek troops, and they pretended that they'd all left. And they left the, the horse allegedly as a gift. The Trojans pulled it in. Out came all the people. Late at night, after the Trojans had drunk themselves silly feasting on their victory feast, they killed as many of the Trojans as they could, and they burned the city. Also from that comes the phrase, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. So, there was one other great legendary thing that happened in Greece. And that may or may not have something to do with the legend of Atlantis. You've heard of the Minotaur and the Labyrinth? Well, supposedly the king of Crete, which was a highly developed civilization, the king of Crete had this labyrinth where he kept his bastard son, the Minotaur, who had the head of a bull and the body of a man. And the Athenians had to sacrifice their nicest youths and maidens to it uh, in order to keep the Cretans from cleaning their clocks. Well, supposedly, to the north of this island of Crete uh, was another island which is today called Santorini or Thera. And this allegedly was the center of the Cretan or Minoan civilization. Many archaeologists today believe that the explosion of the volcano of Thera, which basically destroyed the Minoan civilization, was responsible on the one hand for the uh, liberation, of, I mean for the legend rather of Atlantis, and secondly, to the liberation of the Greeks. Had the Minoan Empire not been rattled to its foundations, Greek civilization as we know it could never have developed. Now we'll set the civilizations to one side. In each of these civilizations, the original revelation given to mankind became more or less distorted. Why? Because compared with the way their ancestors had lived, these people were doing pretty well. And you may not realize it, living as you do in the wealthiest and most powerful and most opulent nation in the world, but such things don't always make one all that interested in truth. I know it's hard to believe, but it's true. So, in the very centers of civilization, the original revelation got really, really corrupt indeed. However, it remained pure amongst one set of people. A group of shepherds way out in the desert. They were sort of on the fringes of Sumeria, a place called Ur of the Chaldees. Now, they're, um, they come into history, of course, with Abraham. And you know who we're talking about. We're talking about the Hebrews. And while to the Chinese and the Sumerians and the Egyptians and the Greeks and so forth, God gave the gifts of civilization. To the Hebrews alone, he gave, as it were, a sort of infallibility as far as keeping divine truth. And yet, throughout their history, they showed that they really weren't worthy of it. Because any time they were given half a chance, despite the fact that they had the entirety of Revelation, despite the fact that he continually performed miracles for them, you know what? Those people would slough off anyway. They didn't care. Very much like us as individuals, as you'll find out the next time you go to confession. So, what then occurred was that the Hebrews, as you know from, uh, from the uh, Bible, came eventually to the land of Canaan, which was promised them to Abraham by God. You know the story about his sacrificing or attempting to sacrifice Isaac and God stopping him and all that. And you know the story of the flight into Egypt and Joseph. Interestingly enough, all the aspects of Joseph's story, the main outlines, have been confirmed by archaeology. We know that, again, I forget which one, but we know that one of the pharaohs of Egypt had a counselor whose name in Egyptian sounds a lot like Joseph, that he was from an obscure tribe in the north, and because of his favor with the pharaoh, they were undergoing all kinds of, um, all kinds of uh, problems and difficulties. And so they came down and settled in Egypt. 
Now, we also know that in Egypt, they were eventually held in captivity. And we also know, true, that there arose Moses. And now, we come to a very interesting supposition, a theory which has been advanced. You know the plagues that Moses promised Pharaoh if he did not um, release the children of Israel. I have read, uh, and of course I forget the details as I am wont to do, a very involved explanation of how, save the last plague, the death of the firstborn, all of the plagues that were visited upon the Egyptians might be accounted for from the fallout of the explosion of that self-same <laughs> self volcano of Thera. The death of the firstborn, I should tell you, apparently has some parallel in Egyptian records. That's something else I've just read, which is sort of interesting. Uh, even as the recent discovery in the past 10 years of the lost city of Ebla in Syria has given all sorts of extra witness to a lot of the events of the Old Testament. It's, a, it's really exciting being around these days, gentlemen, because every day, it seems, there's some new discovery like this. It's, it's really a thrill. But to return to the question of Thera, let us pretend for a moment that those who theorize about it are correct. That there was a volcano that, on the one hand, destroyed the Minoan civilization and allowed the Greeks the free reign which they would need in order to be the great philosophers and so on they were by the time the Christ came. Contrarywise, by that same effort, which somehow or other Moses was able to predict to Pharaoh, the children of Israel were liberated. And all at just the right times, all at just the right times to get in motion what would be needed for the coming of the Messiah. God is the Lord of history. Everything works to his ends. We can't see those ends. Our lives are too short. Our history is too distorted. We don't know what we're doing anyway. But if there is one article of faith I would like you to take away tonight, let it be that one. God is the absolute Lord of history. And our goal on this earth, part of saving our soul, is to play whatever role in the history of our time he has appointed to us. We don't know what that role is, really. We can't sit down and figure it out. But by attempting to the best of our ability to give ourselves over to his will, to always say, not my will, O Lord, but thine be done. The more honestly and the more sincerely we do that, the likelier it is we will play up our part, our part assigned by him in this great drama in which we live. And a good part of our salvation rests on that. And now, I've said as much as I can, tonight's lecture has come to an end. It's time for, well, I should say next week, we get into the rise and fall of empires and the preparation for the Messiah. So that'll be a lot of fun. Not next week, but next session. All right, questions. Not all at once. Take turns. In that uh, part of Eden was a physical place. Mm -hmm. would, would Adam and Eve be subjected to time? Well, that's another one of them questions that I really can't answer, and it's one that the church fathers really worried their heads over. I have no answer. I don't know. Uh, I suppose, my, my own guess, this is again, surely a guess, uh, I suppose they would be subject to time, but not in the way that we are. I mean, for us, time's a threat. Time's the enemy. You know, you get old, and you're going to die, and you're going to get sick. And even if you make some gains, you're going to lose something thereby. If, if you don't die today, certainly some of your friends will. Uh, I knew I'd gotten old when every New Year's I started asking myself, I wonder who gets it this year. You know, that's only been in the past six or seven years. But sure enough, every year somebody I know gets it. Uh, so I don't, if they were subject to time, it would not have been in the sort of adversarial role that we're, that it faces us with. 
it would have been perhaps the way it is with us at its best. You know, the unfolding of the seasons, being able to enjoy the change of things. You know how it is. You, you know that you live, on, you live your life on two levels. You say it's summer again, and you like summer. But you also realize it's summer of 1995. The summer of 1994 is gone. The summer of 1984. And you're, 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 you look at the changing of the seasons with two different views. I would, I would just guess that they only had the one. Abraham. They're all his children. Interestingly enough, though, the Arabs also claim descent from him. Uh, you remember Ishmael? That's the father of the Arabs, without whom there would be no veils on Jordanians. Uh, long other story. Forget the veils. Yep. Abraham as if he's a reality, a historical figure. If you read the Bible carefully, you realize they're contemporaries. Abraham and Noah? Noah was still alive. Ah, when Abraham was born. Ah, I guess you're right, yeah. 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 Well, it just shows to go you they don't know everything they pretend to. If they did, they'd have stayed in their habit. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, did I? Questions, complaints? Yes, I'm all for it. Well, because because Abel sacrificed his very best, and he did it with complete sincerity and offered the best of what he had. Cain, on the other hand, did not. We are told by the church fathers that Cain just sort of gave grudgingly. God loves a cheerful giver. And of course, as is often the case in contemporary life. He made the initial sin worse. You know, he gives his sacrifice grudgingly. His brother doesn't. So God accepts the one sacrifice, doesn't want the other. Well, this gets Cain very upset. But does he say, gee, maybe I ought to try and work on my will? No. He goes after Abel. And if that doesn't prove that he was the son of Adam, nothing will. I remember, uh, remember last time I said that Adam proved he was our father by, uh, uh, you know, the first time he's challenged by God, he offers two cop-outs in one sentence. <laughs> it was the woman you gave me. She did it. Well, so too, Uncle Cain showed that we were blood relations too. We'll always look elsewhere when the fault is with us. And it's, one of the things that always strikes about the Bible is how human nature doesn't change. What I find interesting is that Cain's offering was the work of human hands and the fruit of the earth. Does that sound familiar? Mm hmm I don't recall. Bible scholar Beersack, which was which? Yeah, and Abel was the uh, Abel was the herdsman, and that's why Cain was made to be a herdsman to punish him. Well, I don't know what, if any, significance there is to that. Mr. Be Mr. Beersack. Vocally. <laughs> no, no. Uh, in their case, it was a direct, a direct uh, thing. Probably even more direct than Moses in the burning bush. Notice, uh, if you will, that while on the one sense in the ancient world there's growth, etc., leading up in in a temporal scale, there's growth leading up to the coming of our Lord. On a spiritual scale, there's a decline. 
outside of the Hebrews. And then with them, it's just a rocky road. But everywhere else, everything, everyone's getting more and more depraved, and as it were, God is getting more and more removed. So, to Abraham, our father, he speaks directly. To Moses, he speaks in the burning bush, which implies some sort of medium. Uh, and finally, in the latter part of the Old Testament, he didn't talk to anybody. You know, he inspires people and people have dreams and all that, but he, he just didn't talk to them. Hmm. Uh, and then our Lord comes and everything changes. But that's the other thing you've got to get in mind. Although in terms of the works of men, there was a growth prior to the coming of our Lord. Everything else was declining. Uh, people were getting more and more depraved. The original revelation got ever more corrupted. I mean, we know that it survived to a greater or lesser degree outside the Hebrew clan for a while. How do we know this? Moses' wife was the daughter of Jethro, a priest of the Most High. What priesthood was this? It obviously was not the priesthood of Moses, because, of course, that hadn't been established yet. It was another priesthood, like that of Melchizedek. What happened to these other priesthoods? Who knows? Probably they became more corrupted or died out. Uh, at some point, and when would vary from place to place, when the original revelation became corrupt enough, it ceased to assist in one's salvation. And I can't tell you quite when that point would have been. Uh, one of the things that the Church Fathers argued about a lot was, what about the salvation of Gentiles before the fall? I mean, as I was before the coming of our Lord. Some of them held that only circumcised Hebrews could be justified. Others held, including my favorite St. Clement of Alexandria, that Gentiles, if they lived in expectation of the coming of the Messiah, which was a tradition also that was held amongst all peoples, again, more or less corrupted, but if they lived in expectation of, a coming, of the coming of the Messiah, they too could be saved. But that was, so uh, St. Clement, for instance, held that Virgil could have been saved because in his fourth eclogue, he predicts the coming of the Messiah. But Dante, representing the other wave, held that it was impossible for him to enter into heaven, so he kept the limbo of the fathers going. It's one of those imponderables. Take your pick. Your soul doesn't depend on it, so in one sense it doesn't matter. That help? Uh, everyone else satisfied? They All means everything and everything means everything? No questions? We do. For instance, St. Francis Xavier uh, went out into the Far East and preached to huge mobs of people of different nationalities, spoke in his native tongue, and uh, everybody understood him, just like in the Acts of the Apostles. That isn't a very long time. And it goes on to the present, here and there. When, um, who was it I was reading about had the gift of tongues? As a missionary, anyway. I don't remember who it was. But remember that the gift of tongues requires two things. One, a great deal of sanctity on the part of the individual to whom it's given. And two, a reason for it. So what you would need would be a very holy missionary. And remember what kind of people we send out to the missions now. Marry and all. Bring liberation theology to the millions. Don't give them the baptism, give them guns. What, do, you, do, you think, uh, do you think one of your marine old missionaries is going to suddenly get the gift of tongues? He'd have to be baptized first. Well, not baptized, but, you know, he'd have to become a Catholic. So, my answer is that one reason why these gifts come fewer and fewer is that the number of truly faithful Catholics has so declined. This is off the, off the, be, off the path, really, but... There has been, again, in a weird way, a prefiguring. Just as I've said, the ancient world was declining. Well, so too with us. We're going through the same process again. 
That's why our Lord said, think you when the Son of Man returns, you will find faith upon the earth. And the, way, the very way he asked the question was very, hmm, don't count on it. Uh, well, this is far, far in advance of ourselves, but what you notice from church history is that every episode, like the one we're going through, a lot is lost, then the church pulls herself together again, something is regained, but it's never quite as grand as it was before. And this will probably go on to the very end. Uh, the church lost, as it were, her first youth with the Arian heresy and never got it back. And then with the uh, historians and the Monophysites, she lost most of Egypt and Ethiopia and Syria and Persia, Armenia. Never got them back. And now they're not there to be gotten back. Even if all the Copts and all the uh, Jacobites and all the Armenians and all that were brought into the church, which may happen, Egypt would not be brought back. Armenia would not be brought back. Syria would not be brought back. Because as Christian countries, they don't exist anymore. And then when the East split off, same thing. Occasional reunions, but never lasting. And if we were to get all of Eastern Orthodoxy back in tomorrow, where today is Christian Asia Minor? Yeah. You know, it's gone. And then uh, when the Great Schism occurred, you had three different popes, never again was the papacy what it had been. Uh, and then you had the Reformation, and yeah, we got Latin America and various other places to make up in numbers, but we've never been the same since we lost Northern Europe. And the French Revolution, well, we survived that, and we had the 19th century revival in the early 20th, and picked up a lot of lost ground, but we never got everything back. And now this, and I predict, like Criswell, that if, um, if um, you will be my slave of prophecy, if, um, if we come through this, if these are not the last days, then we'll Humpty Dumpty will be put back together somewhat, but we'll never be what we were before Vatican II. And I tell you, another couple of crises, crises like this last one. <laughs> we'll be lucky if the, uh, if the Pope and the Holy See aren't a couple of old Italians in a tavern in Naples. So, anyway, that's, uh, or Bari, as the case may be. So, there's your, uh, there's your answer, to the best of my ability. Anything else, gang? Okay, going once, going twice. So, until next time, drink up, enjoy. We'll see you later.